Welcome to Finding Career Zen. I'm your host, Pete Newsom, and I'm joined today by Leslie Heimer. Leslie is a third generation lending professional with more than 20 years of experience in real estate. She's currently running a thriving mortgage practice as a real estate advisor with Stockworth, where she offers concierge services to her clients with the highest possible level of customer service. Prior to Stockworth, Leslie was a chief lending officer and was named one of the 100 most powerful women in banking by the National Mortgage Professionals magazine. Leslie is also a contributor for the prestigious Scotsman Guide and was recently named most connected for real estate lending by NMP publication for her social media influence and thought leadership, which I've seen personally and really enjoyed watching. <laughs> Leslie has been recognized on the cover of Focus Magazine, the Orlando Business Journal, and Orange Appeal Magazine for real estate and marketing strategies, and was given the Women with Vision Award in 2020. Orlando Family Magazine re recognized Leslie as top 50 real estate professionals year over year since 2017. Leslie earned her under undergraduate degree from University of Florida, which I will not hold against her too much. <laughs> I this see your FSU goodies. That's right. That's right. As well as a Master of Business Administration or MBA from the University of Maryland with a focus in marketing. So Leslie, with all of that said, is it safe to say you're a boss? I'm a boss. I will, I will say that. I I've think. earned it at the young age of 44. I, I'm proud of that nowadays. That's a long list of accomplishments for 44. I have to say Thank that you. too. Really, I feel like you know, when you're when you're in your 40s, you feel, when you're young, you always think that by the time I'm 30, I'll be this. By the time I'm 40, I'll be this. So well, we're getting into it right away. I hold <laughs> thought because I, 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 I but because I first have to say there was something from your bio that I did not read yet, and it's that you're a seventh generation Floridian as yeah. I am. Oh, oh Pete, I did thing. not know that. Yeah, I didn't know I that. I feel like that's either. so such a treasure. It's rare. Can you can you uh, like follow that line back? Do you? Yeah, I mean, my family it? are really nerd out about it. They're much better at the like lineage than I am, and like the guy who walked here. There was like a land grant that my great great grandfather was given, and bones mazel and uh the lamp before time references to my family in the book so they're much better about it than i am all i know is most of my friends are surprised that i am from polk county from polk county okay i was going to ask what part of the state yeah they, they lived in okay my mine is a little farther north madison county okay yeah i mean at the end of the day if you're a seventh generation floridian you came from a small town you I know think we're probably related it's we gotta be there's no <laughs> doubt <laughs> we'll, we'll follow up on that later because i have a lot of research there's a lot of work that um my dad's aunt did Interesting. and i have it all it's actually on the shelves behind me in binders so i would love that pete my uncle would like die for that cool all right good well we'll follow up on that but i think i think it, you know let, let's focus instead a little bit on what will hopefully be interesting to everyone else listening which is really the success that you've had in your career I want to explore, you know, how you got here. So let's let's just start with that. I'm going to start at the very beginning. What okay. was your first job? Yeah, my first job was working for my parents' mortgage company, answering the phones and listening to my mother, who um, is an uh, is an unknowing, brilliant saleswoman, uh, but just a very genuine in her approach. And I would sit outside in our reception office and listen to her speak differently to the elderly lady calling about this mortgage than she would to the young guy talking about this mortgage. And I could just hear her communicate up and down the ladder and just fascinating, even though she didn't do it with any intention. I love that. And, it, and it's so it, impactful for me as a career salesperson to know exactly what that means. It, it, it really, it, I do it so naturally. And I'm like, wow, it just, it was a fascinating study to hear and you know my mom is a sweet southern lady and had been doing mortgages and finance her whole life she sent me to college without any student loans and that was my college graduation gift was a return on her investment and some shares in her company and yeah wow i always, I always tell a funny story because i have some team members and employees who have gone through maternity leave and you know it's such a different world nowadays for mothers trying to raise their families which i'm so grateful that i can create a different environment for them because i always say the the toughest boss i ever had 
after I had my second son did not allow me a maternity leave and instead turned our conference room into um, a nursery and hired a nanny on site so I could come right back to work. And that was my mother. <laughs> she was... <laughs> I, I didn't see that coming. I should have, but I, I didn't see that coming. That, yeah. That was your mother who, who did that. And Yeah. And so how long were you, how long did you get to stay home or were you? Yeah, like a, a week place? or two. Yeah. You know, it just was women who grew up in like my mom's generation, that work life balance was so very different than what we get to enjoy. And hopefully what I allow my team to enjoy um, in their, you know, family raising and balancing acts that have to happen when you are a working mother or father. It's, it's, it's a changing world. It's a vastly different world from the one your mother was, you know, was operating in that, you know, that's an understatement, right? Yeah, totally. Um, well, well, let's explore that a little bit. What, what do you think about the changes? Do you think we're in a good spot? Do you think the changes are positive or, or, um, you know, I do think they're positive. I will tell you, Pete, that I struggle sometimes with some of that, um, you know, creating a wonderfully healthy, happy, fun work environment and being able to maximize our productivity. But I think the pandemic changed all of us a lot and changed what we perceive as productive and necessary, you know, definitely made us cut out some things that are no longer necessary. But I think we have learned a lot from the millennials. And, you know, I think it's helped me kind of make sure that my values are aligned. I'm a recovering workaholic, I say. So I think the the younger generations have helped us see that maybe, you know, life's um, success is not measured only by the plaques on the wall or the figures in your bank account, but, you know, the experiences and the ability to be present and have more freedom. Um, that is certainly something that I have been fortunate to learn from some of my team members. Yeah, and, and as you alluded to, the pandemic was, a sil the silver lining from that, it sounds like for you, and it certainly was for me, was being forced to change your habits. Um, totally. To, forced to stay home, forced to spend time that you know you, you probably should have always, but it just it, it wasn't the mode you're in. It wasn't, it wasn't how things right. flowed. And, it didn't and, seem like an option, to be honest. No, it didn't. It didn't seem like a good option. Right, right. right. <laughs> One you should choose. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's for sure. It, now, when going back to, um, uh, you know, to how you, you were raised, so to speak, was that something that was talked about or was it some, you know, that work ethic? How was it instilled? Um, did it just happen by osmosis, so to speak, and, and having a good mentor? Because I, I will still say that having, despite the benefit that we now see of not being a workaholic. And I, and I want to challenge that a little bit later, because I think you still may be <laughs> on social media. Um, but there's still, you know, inherent value of, of, of hard work and, and, and what that delivers. So um, was yeah. it a conscious thing? Of, I mean, I do, I do think it was by osmosis, but I was so proud of the mother that my mother was and what she accomplished and quite frankly the lifestyle and the, the blessings that she was able to give us because of her hard work and my father's hard work certainly also but she was always a mom who worked outside the home and i was always very excited to be a businesswoman i would dress up in my mom's clothes to be a businesswoman you know maybe we just learn so much from our parents that we don't even realize we are but i always wanted to go to school to uh, be in business. I, um, you know, I used to say, I'm not going to go to college all these years and start popping out babies, but I love my angel babies, but I was certainly intentional about being a working mother and tried to tell myself that it was about, you know, quality over quantity. So I, you know, did make those choices when my children were young. And I do feel like still today that uh, my work ethic has, um, been, you know, what has given me the more, more of the opportunities that I have today in the career that I have. I don't think I would have been able to, you know, accomplish the things that I have without just trying to every day crush, crush, crush. And, you know, the hustle mentality and which I know some people think is kind of outdated, but that's how I did it. Yeah. I, you know, it, as you, as you mentioned earlier, how success is defined, um, 
is, is a big component of whether hustling is necessary. So if you want career success and if you want to outperform others, if you want to reach the pinnacle of any profession that you choose, I don't know how to get there without hard work. Yeah, I love that. I love that, Pete. And I appreciate you allowing the space to say, I don't know another way either. If we did, we, we would take that right. I would have done it. Yeah. And I've said that for years is that I don't know, but you know, my first job out, of, I was a, a senior at, at FSU and I was um, the poli sci degree and a two point something GPA. So the um, you know firms were not knocking down my door. Right. <laughs> You're hanging in there though. Yeah. Um, I, I took a job with a staffing company and, in the interview, uh, in the spring of my senior year, they, the guy said, we work eight to eight Monday through Thursday, eight to five on Friday. Should we continue? That was the first, that was an introduction to this company and, you know, with $20 to my name. And like I said, you know, not the most, um, attractive credentials coming out of school. I, I took the job and, and the work ethic, I already had a good work ethic from just growing up and, and having to work, but the, the hours that, that I worked then carried me forward everywhere else I went for the rest of my career. It seemed easy by comparison. Right. And yes. they outworked everyone. And, and the, and the company was, was incredibly successful, wildly successful. They're, they're in the staffing space. They're a $10 billion privately held organization. And wow. they did it by of course, having you know good business practices and being consistent and honest, ethical, all the things you, we should right. take for granted. Well, they outworked everyone. And I've never been able to get away from that thought. Yeah, I love that you said by comparison, everything else was because that's exactly it. You know, when, it, when I left my mother's little wing and went and had a new job, you know, I treated every job like I own the company. I'm going to sweep the floor if it needs to be sweeped and I'm going to stay late. I, did, I remember being so fearful to leave the building before the boss left just because I didn't think that that would look good. So I would just sit in my little office and figure something, you know, but it wouldn't you, have looked good. That was it wouldn't. Instinct, right? You, right. I just wanted to show them that I'm a company girl and I will do anything. And, and I got promoted very quickly. And, you know, those kinds of things are noticed. And I just, I do feel like that just, you know, I don't know. There's a friends episode that I still love when Jennifer Aniston starts smoking cigarettes just so she can hang out on the balcony with the boss because that's where the gossip happened and that's where she knew of her promotion. And now I don't condone smoking cigarettes, but FaceTime with the leadership and being present certainly, you know, gives you a little insight into things that are happening in the company, I guess. Well, without, without having any real idea what you were going to say today, I'm not at all surprised that you are talking about the things that, uh, are generally accepted as you know, how success happens in, in the professional world. And to me, you know, in my head, I'm thinking you're, you're managing your career. You're managing your own success. You're not, you're not taking anything for granted. You're not relying on someone else. You're consciously doing the things that will lead to a promotion, advancement, recognition, whatever that is. So, you know, when, when you were doing those things, was it conscious or was it just, that's what you're supposed to do? Um, I think both. I d it was definitely conscious. I wanted to be the best. I wanted a promotion. I wanted that bigger office. I wanted my production to beat John Joe's production. Or I, I definitely made it a priority. Got it. Now, with with your kids, have you tried to instill those same? Those poor kids. I mean, now that's a whole different. Sorry, those kids are screwed. Okay, Pete. Let's be honest. <laughs> no, well, just kidding. No, you're not kidding though. I don't think. I mean, I certainly, I, you know, I used to give, I, when I would have organizations ask me to speak on the work-life balance, I had a little fun pie chart that would say M-Y-T-H. It's a myth. There is no such thing. Some days I was a really good mom and some days I was squealing in on two tires because I forgot about the field trip. And I did, I was lucky to have help when my kids were young and I did outsource some of that and tried to be as present as possible when 
dinner when it was dinner time or weekends. Um, but I definitely was a working mom and you know, maybe I justified it when they were young by saying, well, they're going to see how hard mom works and I want them to know that they're going to have more opportunities in life because I've worked hard to give them some of those opportunities. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes I struggle with myself. Like, was that being selfish? Maybe I just wanted my goals. Um, obviously, my kiddos are great and wonderful and fine. Um, but, you know, I think every mom will have guilt no matter what. If you're a stay-at-home mom, if you're a working mom. Um, but I definitely was very focused on my career when my kids were. I was not the PTA president. Do you, do you think... <laughs> <laughs> but you, were, you were present, right? So I... I, I knew of you um because we have you know we have sons in the same in the same class who played football together in high school so i'd see you there um but then it wasn't until we connected on social media when i saw how much you do so that's why i kind of laughed when you said you're no longer a workaholic because outwardly you sure appear to be um oh. yeah you, well now my kids are like grown they don't even let me play with them anymore so maybe my recovery has regressed <laughs> well, and maybe that's not a bad thing, right? Because everything has its has its time and place in life. But you know, when you talk about guilt, do you think that's a function of what society you know, yes. society place that on you? Um, even though yeah. maybe it's unfounded, because what you're describing is is a, you're you're describing yourself as the same mentor that motivated you growing up. I mean, what it, it's very yeah. Funny. And I know sometimes I have to talk to my therapist about that. Like, do I have some challenges with my own mother? <laughs> no, I do. I think you're right, Pete. Society definitely makes mothers and women and fathers feel a certain way. And, you know, it is hard in this world of social media. Um, you're constantly worried about what someone else is going to think or what how someone's going to judge you or feel. And, you know, it's part of my daily affirmation journaling that I have to operate outside of that fear right? Of fear of what other people are going to think, or fear of what other people are going to judge you by. Um, but it is, it's a, it's a dichotomy in this world and things are changing in our social culture and the expectation to be a fully present full-time mom and a full-time, you know, employee and client provider. It is always a juggle. I think that, I don't think some of those things haven't changed as much as our culture would like for them to have changed. Um, but I certainly do not make any apologies for the fact that I did put my career, not before my children, but it was a close second for most of their lives. That's a great, that's a great way to phrase it. And I think it's very commendable that, that you're conscious of it and unapologetic for it as you should be, right? I mean, there's no, there's, there, I can't think of a better, we need good mentors right now. You know, society, young people need good, good mentors. And we, we could talk for hours, if not days, I'm sure, about how children are raised today, even in the last, let's say, you know, 10 years, um, you know, what, what's changed. I think our, our kids were sort of, you know, being right around 20, right? We're, mm -hmm, we're sort yeah. of part of that evolution. And um, I, I think half the generation was raised one way because you, the backlash of, parenting, you know, I'll just say it, right? The um, participation trophy approach that, that happened a little bit before ours were born. Right. You know, I think I did as a parent, I started to see the backlash of that. I started to see the downside uh, downside of that because look, life is not easy. And, and one of the things that I hope will, this is one of the early episodes of, of, um, of this new podcast, Finding Careers In, but I think what has to come out is you know, acknowledging that life is not going to hand you things. Life is not going to be easy. It's not always going to go your way. And you have to fight and climb and, and work really hard to, um, you know, to, to achieve. And that's okay. Like that's I love not that. Bad. So yes, Pete, I can tell you that my oldest is in his twenties and starting off in college. And for all of my self depreciation of being a working mom, you know, my husband and I both felt like, gosh, you know, did we prepare him well enough for just how freaking hard life is? Because you don't want them to freak out when something 
happens that you know is going to happen because it's life. And I think social media, where I am so guilty of it too, I try to be authentic and real, but I'm not going to put that so-and-so and all the troubles and the drama, but that is the real life, you know, not the highlight reel that we see on Instagram. And I think it, it can be such a crippling effect on all of us if we only think that it's rainbows and unicorns every day. Well, we're not serving anyone well by, right. by making them think life is easier than it is or success will happen sooner or faster than, than it will. I, I, quite the opposite. And um, like we talked about earlier, if we had examples of how to, how to cut corners and, and how to <laughs> succeed right. quickly and easily, then we, of course, would share that. But here we are still you know, working hard uh, because we have ambition and goals and that should be rewarded, right? That should be um, celebrated, not admonished and, and certainly not you know, avoided in conversation. And I think a lot of parents experience what, what you're talking about, what, what I've experienced myself, which is I worked really hard to provide the life for my kids that I, I wanted them to have, but in doing so, I Darn did it. shield them from adversity and struggle. Right. And, and they think life is easier than it is, and it scares the hell out of me. Same, Pete. Like, I did not want to raise two soft kiddos. You know, my husband used to say, stop cutting up his waffles. And that's like the funny metaphor in our house because <laughs> stop cutting their waffles. Like, <laughs> that, that should be that sh that could be uh, that could be its own thing. podcast that could be its own thing stop cutting their waffles and i'll be very disappointed in you if you don't either turn that into a book or a podcast or something. <laughs> okay I'm to, I'm challenge to accepted yes yeah. okay. stop cutting gosh i mean that's really perfect leslie <laughs> because that that same joke at ei4 and and my youngest um that was almost verbatim the lingering <laughs> joke with him was like are you still doing this, this right thing? it's just so hard it's just so natural to just want to love them right to death you know yeah and and i suspect as i as i continue to do uh, more of these podcasts um that this is going to be a recurring theme and so we you know can can move on from this but let, let's just let it be said that you know, for anyone listening who wants to achieve the kind of success Leslie's achieved that it hasn't happened easily and it didn't happen overnight. Is that, is that fair? That to say? is very fair to say lots of bumps. Listen, I am an, I'm a third generation mortgage lender. My grandmother was the first female banking lending banker in central Florida. It was a big deal in the sixties, right? You can imagine she was the only one wearing a skirt in the boardroom. So my whole life I've been in mortgages and real estate and we owned a mortgage company in 2008. So trust me when I say there have been some ups and downs. And I always say that I don't think, um, you know, it's never and kind of ties into our, our children and, and the next generation. It's never the smartest person, the most brilliant, the most innovative, creative, right? Because there's plenty of those folks, but I think it is the grit and the guts and the resilience of the, those, that's what makes a superstar in my opinion. Like, do you have the stomach to get back up and do it again? Every time, every single solitary time. Great advice. Great advice. And it's, you know, failure is necessary to evolve, to learn. And, and I, you know, have learned so many of those lessons painfully in the moment um, over the last almost 17 years since I started my staffing company. And, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's really, you don't see it at the time. Um, it's impossible to, but if you are committed to staying on course if, if failure is not an option in your mind no matter how many times right. you get kicked how many times you get knocked down each time you get up you're better for it you 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 learn more um there's a lesson that that hopefully comes from it that you can avoid making that mistake again but you okay. have to make it in the first place right yeah you're you really just in a book. no one else can tell you what it's going to feel like you have to actually do it you and do i've read all those books i've read them all twice <laughs> no they don't you know it's 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 like I, I've never, I've never been shot at, but but I assume that reading about war, reading about 
um, you know, that, that happening in, in a book, see it, we all see it in movies, it in no way represents what it's actually like. And, yeah, and, it's and, a great. I mean, it's a terrible visual. analogy. To you. No, it, but it's powerful. It's effective analogy. But, but we have to experience failure and, and frustration in order to, if much as anything, to enjoy success, right? Because, if, right. you know, and that's another thing with if, where if it always seems too easy, you think you're smarter than you are. You think you're, you're doing things right, even though you, you may just have not gotten caught yet. Right. right. By, yeah, by right. Doing things the right way. And I, I also believe that it makes it harder to enjoy the true successes um, because if you don't earn it, if you don't work for it, if it doesn't happen by paying a price, it, it probably lacks meaning. I, I think that too. And I hate to be like, you know, have a, a old, outdated, old fashioned mentality, but you know, you do have to earn, earn your stripes in a way, you know, no, no like doubt. You said, if there was a shortcut, I'm excited for somebody to find that. But my shortcut was grinding it out. That's right. That's and not starting true. over yet again. So with that, so with that said, what advice would you give to um, someone earlier in their career who wants to go into real estate or wants to go into lending? Yeah, I would definitely say that relationships are so important. You know, re relationships. I've moved a couple of times in my life, and every time you move, especially when you're in sales, because at the end of the day, we're in sales, right? When you're in sales, and I have a certain pet peeve for people that say, I'm not in sales. Let me tell you something, we're all in sales. I don't care if your job is in IT and you're programming code every day behind your computer, you still have to sell yourself to your boss, to your spouse. We all need those skills to market and make ourselves be marketable and relationships. Even Orlando, I always say we're, we both come from probably small towns. Orlando's like the biggest small town. And the people that you know and the reputation that you create really does just matter so, so much more than you realize, um, especially when you're first starting out. So just to try to never burn a bridge and yeah, stay late. Don't leave before the boss. I mean, maybe that's a, a outdated notion, but it, it just being there a lot of times it's, you know, you always say like, there's no such thing as luck. And yeah, it was lucky that maybe I was still at work at seven o'clock when they needed somebody to help on a $30 million proposal that was about to go off in an RFP to the government. But it was lucky that I was there, but I was there at seven o'clock and none of the other interns were. Yeah, Those kinds of things are just how I've had some opportunities in life. I heard a quote over the weekend and the guy who, um, who said his name escapes me right now. I'm going to, I'll put it in the, in the show notes, but it, it was something along the lines of that luck is the residue of planning. Um, and Love you could that. also say luck is a residue of planning and, and effort. And, um, you know, I like to say I've been lucky at times, but I've, for each time I think I've been lucky, I've been equally unlucky. Right, balanced, right. Right, with, with over time, with work, it, it does balance out. And this is consistent with, I think, what seems to be a theme of our conversation, which is, um, you know, it, relationships don't happen Meaningful relationships, quality relationships, lasting relationships, they don't happen quickly, right? They have to yeah. be earned Trust. like everything yeah. else. That's so true. And you have to invest in them. You, you do it constantly, right? You have to feed them, water them, just, yep. just like anything in life. If, if you want it to grow and prosper, it, it requires attention along the way. And um, you would you say everyone is in sales? I think that is also something that is understated or or not acknowledged enough is in to me it, in terms of career um, advancement or, or success you have to be conscious of what that means you know if you're a programmer well you you, you have to sell yourself to some degree if you're looking to to advance right if you if you don't want that then you know no harm no foul right by right. all means, keep your head down. Don't interact right. with people. Don't look to build relationships. Right. But if you are ambitious and you want to achieve more, um, that that is going to almost always be tied into someone else's opinion, someone else's 
uh, perspective of you and you have to manage it. You do. You have to go to the Christmas party even if you don't feel like it. You have to, you know, be about the company. And, you know, I've had adults, you know, that were lateral in my position in other corporations and maybe I was the BD girl and they were had a different role and they're like, oh, well, I'm, I'm not in business development. I don't have to go. Well, you are because the company pays your salary because of those types of of efforts so in all to me in all large corporations or small entrepreneurial businesses the senior leadership certainly is expected to be in business development or sales for, for sure and, and i think some of these things that we're talking about can be perceived negatively today or i know i just don't i hate that i wish that weren't the case you know i don't like that a salesperson is considered icky it's a it's a wonderfully fruitful honorable career absolutely and, and anyone in sales over any period of time you know has to have high quality traits that, exactly. that you know are generally considered admirable in any in any um situation you know you have to be honest you have to be you have high integrity you have to be consistent right. reliable accessible i mean these are all very attractive right. traits for, that anyone should strive to possess exactly um, but as a salesperson, all you have is your reputation, really. That's it. And That's um, it. you know, folks like us have you know guard that you know at all costs, and and can't afford to cut. Absolutely, a and it's tough it sometimes because there's some crazy people out there. But <laughs> there are indeed. You got to make them happy at the end of the day and do the right thing. Yeah, I mean, being being the Boy Scout or Girl Scout, and and at times seems like you're the chump too. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, you know, I'll never regret doing the right thing uh, you know, in any situation right. um, because that's how you sleep well at night too. It's true. And, that's and it is hard sometimes. You do feel like you're right. Sometimes you feel like you're swallowing your pride a little bit, like, cause you know, we all want to be, you know, kind of protect our ego, but I just always have to check myself when those situations arise and say, okay, Leslie, is this your ego, you know, that's making these emotions, is an emotional decision and really, you know, get in your head a little bit, like those touchy feelings, things that we talked about to make sure that the decision I'm making is a clear, a clear one and not, you know, about my own pride. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and those things are developed over time as well, right? You're, you're yeah. staying, it's a muscle. Yes. It's another muscle that we have to work out and, and exercise. And the more that we do it, you know, so for anyone young listening, I think we've driven home the point effectively that, you know, don't be afraid of hard work. You know, success doesn't happen overnight and, and, and focus on you know, building relationships and your reputation along the way. So with all of that said, uh, just a couple of more questions. If you went back and, um, and gave yourself advice, 18 year old Leslie, you had a time machine. What would you say to her? I would say this is probably a very specific um, answer. I mean, of course, I'd say all the things like, you know, stop plucking your eyebrows so much. Um, fashion. <laughs> I had to get a little beauty tip in there. But no. You only get one thing to say, and that's how you're going to blow your, your, your <laughs> I will say very specifically, if there are any entrepreneurial folks out there, I, in 2008, we allowed our hope to be a strategy. And hope is not a strategy for business. And you know, as much as all of those manifestations and think positive thinking, you know, you can't just keep, you know, flooding your own resources and depleting your own resources before you make hard decisions. And um, that's just something that has, I, I did learn. And it's one of those things that it rolls off the tongue very easily, but hope is not always a strategy. So surround yourself with the right you know, advice, the right team, the right people who are not just going to be like, yes, men, but are experts in their field that can help you kind of navigate the ship. What would you have uh, said to 18 year old Leslie in particular about 2008 and how to anticipate that? Like I definitely would have shut it down quicker. You know, I would have reeled in the reins quicker. Unfortunately, it is what it is. I would have I would have helped my team find new career paths quicker. So I was two years into starting Four Corner 
and my staffing company. And I, I, you know, any dime I had was, was tied up in that, which is to say I had no, no extra ones. And everyone around me was a real estate genius. Everyone was just, you know, printing money and it seemed too good to be true. Um, which of course we found out it, it was. Always is. And and I kind of feel like that again. You know, do, do you think we may be? This is this is going in a little different direction. But how do you feel about where we are right now? I just saw a chart the other day that showed the um, the housing price to median income is higher right now. The ratio is higher than it than it was in two thousand eight. Yeah, I do think it's I do think it's a very different problem. I tongue in cheek say that I was responsible for half the foreclosures in central Florida in 2008 because congratulations though. And well, you know, because that, that's, that that was, those were the rules. Yes. The lending laws were very different and you could buy a house and I could, would give you hundreds of thousands of dollars, even if you did not have on paper a way to repay that. So it was just a, a very, obviously such a complex industry, but the problem was very different. The credit problem was very different. And now the pendulum has swung the complete opposite with the Dodd-Frank Act. Now underwriting guidelines are brutal. So to me, the difference in this housing situation, most people have a ton of equity because they've been borrowing way below their debt to income ratio because of how strict the underwriting guidelines are. That's not to say that I don't think that there is a recession or a correction happening with the housing prices, but I don't think it is say that, and trust me, the PTSD that I have is serious, Pete. So I would definitely tell you if, you know, I, it certainly keeps me up at night. I just think it's a different problem. So I don't think it will look the same, but I do anticipate, you know, the inflation and the insanity that's happening in the housing market has to change. So I certainly personally am being more uh, cautious um, but the credit issue is not what it was in 2008. Everybody is sitting on a ton of equity. So yeah. that's just like a different scenario. Yeah, I'll tell you more about it later. But there was a, um, I needed to get a loan um, for, for the staffing business as it started to grow back in 2007. And I called SunTrust, who was my, um, my mortgage was through at the time. And I said, hey, I need a home equity loan and, or a line of credit. And they said, how much do you want? I said, how much can I get? And they said, you can get up to 249000 without an appraisal. I said, okay, sounds good. What do I need to do? Come oh, down. We'll send it over. You and your wife come down, sign a couple of papers. And by that afternoon, I was handed a checkbook um, yeah, with the equivalent of two hundred fifty k Without I actually got an appraisal. I absolutely, through no logical conclusion had had that much equity in my home over and over again i mean so just being on the lending side that helps me have a little peace at night because that would never happen it is so hard to get financing nowadays even if you you know you got a millions of dollars in the bank that still doesn't mean you're you know like it's just the pendulum is like the opposite yep. they don't even allow us to lend over 80 percent of the appraise like on and on and on so if that helps you feel well, a little more comfortable that housing part of that and the credit it is not a credit uh bubble well who can you help who should call you and what and what should they call you for um i certainly love helping first-time home buyers i know you know um, this being a Zen gig career kind of podcast, I think if, if our listening demographic are younger, um, I think it is important for young people to build their credit even while you're in college. So one great tip I always have for kids in their 20s, 19, 19, 18, you can buy a house, is to let your parents add you as an authorized signer to their credit cards so you can start building credit and have a great credit score and understand money. They don't teach you these things in school, which is very frustrating to me. Um, but managing your financing, paying your own bills, paying your credit card bill, even if it's a very small credit card, just to build that credit and, you know, uh, begin to understand how those things look in, as an adult as you move forward. I know, you know, those things also evolve with generations, not wanted, some wanted to rent, some wanted to buy, but we all know that renting is crazy nowadays. And I don't think that will change just based sheer on the demand, certainly in Florida. I don't think the rent prices will go down. So 
I would love to help counsel if anybody wanted to prepare to buy a home anytime in the future, but it's important to build your credit when you're young. So this, this is great advice and something I didn't know I, that I'm not doing. So I, I'm hey, gonna, Pete, do one yay. More. I, yeah, I mean, my oldest just graduated from college. She's 22. She's entering the workforce and she's going to want to buy a house at some point. And that credit uh, you know, building of credit is something that plagued me. I was the, the, you know, the, the guy who signed up for the you know, free credit free t-shirt. card. They, they had my fraternity you know, logo on the credit card in college and, <laughs> Didn't pay for two years. Yeah, that's a different story. But <laughs> so, so yeah, just say that one more time if you could. And I think this should be in chapter one of stop cutting their waffles when, <laughs> when I, I'm a that's partner a, in this effort now. Yeah, of, residual. Uh, it's coming your way. Yes, so uh, definitely. So, add, yeah, so, so, so yeah, explain it one, one more time briefly if you could. Yeah, so just you'll have your, you know, um, any students or, or graduates listening, just have your parents add you as an authorized signer to their credit cards. So your parents, if they have good credit, your parents, assuming they have established credit. So, so um, credit algorithms look at not only the um, repayment history, but even more importantly is the history, the length of time that you have had credit and have been a good steward of your finances and are managing available money. So what the most powerful needle mover in a credit algorithm is showing that you, Leslie Heimer, you have access to $1,000, but you're only spending 100 That is the formula for perfect credit. If you have $1,000 and you're spending $999, you are probably you're living outside your means, right? You're, you're not managing your finance as well. So adding a, 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 a co-authorized signer to your credit card will then allow all of that history to be on their credit report. Wonderful. Give them a score. Wow, that that's huge. And and I don't know how I, I didn't know that because it seems like a very important thing. Yay, thank everywhere. you for that feedback. I need to make a I need to make a TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we just did. So <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll perfect. Make a clip of that. Um, <laughs> all right. So we're 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 at the time. I I, t I promise I'd let you go. Uh, but I, one more question, Leslie. At this point, where you are now, have you found careers in? You know what? I think I have. I think I have. And it, it, it only occurred to me when you asked me the first question of our episode is, am I a boss? And you know what? I am. And having some confidence and enough bruises and scars to know what you've been through, you only get confidence through that. And that is kind of my career then to be able to feel finally no imposter syndrome and, and know that every day that I have the tools no matter what the market does to meet the goals that I have for myself. Awesome. Well, from my perspective, what I've seen and why I was so eager to have you on and really appreciate you agreeing um, to come on today is what I see you do on social media um, is, is just such a powerful, um, just awesome thing to see because you're, 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 Showing everyone who you are, you know, professionally and financially, you're, you're, or professionally and personally, you're blurring the two things together, which I have always believed is impossible not to, uh, because I, you're, you're I, Leslie, and that's who you are, and this is who you're going to get. So I, I can just tell you, it, it, you know, from what I've seen, there's your your energy and enthusiasm for what you do is is enviable, and um, you know I get, I know you're a great mentor for for your for your boys. So and much, Pete. That means a lot because I just think the world of you. So coming from you, that truly is I, I appreciate that. Well, back at you. I, I appreciate that. So thank you so much, um, Leslie, for for coming on today. We're gonna put your contact information in the show notes so everyone knows how to get a hold of you. And um, I look forward to. Hey, this, this was again so too. fun. Yeah, thank we'll, you. Thank we'll, you. We'll come back on. So thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Please go on and and rate and and review the podcast. We certainly would appreciate it. And have a wonderful and safe rest of your day. Thanks for listening.